Um, yeah, so uh, welcome everyone to the second remote version of the Zurich Haskell Meetup. I'm really happy to see that we have so many people joining from all over the world. Um, and uh, yeah, we have the Slack channel on the side. Um, ask any questions there uh, that come up during the talk. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, thank you, Niklas, uh, for presenting today. Okay. Thanks, Andreas. I am Niklas, um, Niklas Hambüchen. You can uh, see my name up here actually in the screen share. Um, I uh, do lots of Haskell uh, professionally. I've worked with FP Complete for a little bit more than five years and I've used Haskell for, I think, probably close to 10 years very soon. And um, recently I got into this task of uh, making the async libraries tutorial a little better. And that was a follow-up of, as part of like FP completes uh, consulting and teaching work, and also like working on multiple different projects. Seeing that uh, many people actually get uh, get async wrong or like do some things, which is was in part due to the way that this tutorial was written. So I, I decided that I should improve this tutorial a little bit. The library is very good, but I think from the didactic side, it could um, improve its uh, landing page tutorial a little. So I did that and these changes were merged recently, but they are not uh, deployed yet essentially as the in a new version on Hackage. Um, so um, I'm gonna go through essentially what I wrote into that tutorial with all of you um, uh, viewers here. So it's a little bit of a, a test whether this new tutorial actually works and whether people actually understand what is going on there. So the general rules here of this uh, meetup today are that it's a talk where everybody can just like shout in in the middle if they don't understand anything or um, also if they're coding along, for example, and things go a little bit too fast, um, then you can just like shout in and say, ah, need a little bit of time to like follow up uh, locally. And the general idea is that we would be like, um, make no big presentation or anything, but we just code a little bit here in my editor and explore a couple of things of how to use async correctly and um, also exploring some of the common pitfalls that you can experience when you do not use async or when you do not think of certain things. Um, that's how it works, yes. Um, I have prepared for you, if you wanna get uh, started coding along, um, a little template in here, which is extremely simple. This is what I have here in my editor and in command line at the side. Um, so you can go to github.com slash nh2 and then my newest repo Haskeller Z async tutorial 2020 will contain the contents in here. You can just git clone uh, even this URL if you like, and then you have it. If you're too lazy to type this down from the screen share, you can also put things uh, get this URL, obtain it here from the meetup link. It's at the very bottom in the meetup and it's also put right in here in uh, Slack. I will go to a short tour of what is in there. So we have here under app main, just our simple main file, um, uh, which we will modify. We have a cabal file that describes our project. The only thing relevant there is like the entry point and that we depend on the async library. In a little bit, we will also add some extra stuff to that. And then we say we want to see all extra warnings. And then um, I have a stack.yaml file which says that I want to use the stackage uh, snapshot of all the libraries that are involved of LTS 14.27. And that's it. I can then do a uh, stack build maybe add a little bit so you can see very nicely what is where. And it's gonna build it. Okay. And then you can also do stack run and then it will run our hello world file in that case. So that is something that uh, you should get started setting up or like get running while I explain a little bit more. Okay. So um, when you get started doing Haskell, you write a little bit of code, you learn some like pure functions and whatnot, you learn how to do IO things. These are the requirements we have for this uh, tutorial. Uh, so it's pretty much a beginner talk, I would say beginner to intermediate. And we wanna explore what do we do if we want to do some things in parallel or concurrently. And that is what the async library does. So what does it mean doing something 
in parallel or concurrently. We may have different motivations, right? We may have a CPU intensive job that we want to use all the cores on our multi-core computer of uh, to get that job done in less wall time, less time that passes in the real world. Um, we may also want to achieve some other things. For example, we may be doing networking. Let's say we do some HTTP requests for writing a crawler or something like this, or downloading uh, inputs for a build system, um, or DDoSing somebody on the internet that we don't like, right? All those things we may be doing. And in those cases, we may be doing some web requests. And these web requests, they take, let's say, I don't know, 20 or 100 milliseconds to travel through the lines of the internet, fiber and copper and pigeons and all those things uh, where packets travel across. So when you do such a request, your CPU locally may have to wait for 100 milliseconds doing nothing until the next thing happens. And maybe you want to do multiple things and then it could be very beneficial if you could just start multiple things in parallel and then they would all travel in parallel through your cables. And then you may be able to get uh, large integer factors of speed up. So in general for like parallelism for CPU bound task, you can expect that at best you will get the factor of whatever how many CPU has, right? So if you have four cores, for example, you may get a 4x speed up. But even if you have only one core and you do 100 web requests in parallel to some server across an ocean or so, you may get 100 times speed up without having added any CPU cores. And that's why like concurrent programming, even without any actual multi-core parallelism, it can be extremely useful to make your programs less annoying and make them finish faster. Okay, so let's make, let's simulate uh, a, th a, a thing that we want to do, which is that we want to write a, a function get URL in this case, let's write that here, get URL. And that thing takes a text, which could be the URL, we will just simulate that it does some actual downloading and it does some IO and returns a text, which might be the contents that we're downloading. Okay, so that would be the URL here. And then we can say, um, let's get uh, at the end, we want to return um, that this is like the uh, contents of uh, URL, right? like this. And we want to simulate, however, so that we can see parallel execution actually happening. We want to do put in a couple of sleeps and we want to put in a couple of, um, want to put in a couple of uh, prints to see that stuff is going on. So we can do here in that case, uh, let's first import some stuff. So we add to this thing, we add uh, text to the cabal file so that we can import or if I are import data.text. Okay, and then we also want to sleep a bit. One second, just quit some stuff. Um, that's for the sleeping. Um, and then for printing stuff, um, what's important is that we, in this case, do not want to use the normal, let's say, uh, put um, downloading, like uh, let's say uh, one second has passed, right? But when we do things in parallel, then the output can be interleaved. And uh, put strolling because it's print stuff uh, character by character can give us some interleaved output. We don't want to see that in this case. Instead, we use uh, a library called say. Let's add that here, say, and then we can import say, and then we can say things instead. Now, um, say is very useful. I recommend you to use that actually uh, pretty much everywhere instead of put sterling. So let's use it down here as well, actually. Um, and it makes, it just makes for nice continuous, uh, continuous output in this case. Uh, say uh, takes as arguments texts, and we want to use these string literals in for text instead of strings, we we'll have to enable the um, language extension, overloaded strings in that case. Okay, so we'll use now stack GHCI for fast reloading in here. And then we will see um, 
anything complains, no, only some warnings that we don't use some stuff. Okay, so we can now get URL something, it will start printing stuff and we will insert a couple of suites. So let's put in here first that we say uh, downloading um, and then we say what we're downloading because we will download multiple things. So that would be uh, URL and then we would say starting red delay takes microseconds so we say one times one million like this and we do this like that and then we can say um, maybe one more sleep and then we say downloading URL done okay and then we return these contents so that seems good Let's fix some things that we did incorrectly here. Um, okay, of course, say takes only one argument, so we can bracket them or put the dollar here. There we go. And now we can do um, some get URLs. Let's do get URL URL one, get URL URL two, uh, without any parallelism or concurrency, and. Um, we also, this returns, of course, some results. So for example, results one and two, and then we, uh, we print result one, result two, like that. And then we spell get URL correctly. There we go. Let's run main or a colon main run it with arguments and we can see okay it's now starting to download stuff as we expect doing one after the other printing the seconds that have passed fantastic and then we get the two uh, url contents in here great so far so good let's start with some parallelism so we have done this first this is the little outline of what we will do during the talk so you can maybe peek a bit uh, backwards or ahead in terms of what's going to come um, Let's do some parallelism. For this, you can open these latest versions of the async docs, and I have put them here onto nsu.me slash async docs. And if you go on the page that I've linked, then um, they're also linked in here. And that opens then this page here. I mean, technically it opens this index page and then you click here. And then uh, what you can do is that you can, if you want to compare it with the online async docs that we currently have there, um, but you will then see that the online docs are not so great because they start with the way that you should not write async code. Let's do async here. Just gonna explain that real quick. Okay, so in particular, what um, the current docs uh, do is that they introduce the first code box contains uh, a reference to the async function which is the same name as the async package but the key thing is you should pretty much never use the async function right and but the big problem is that when people learn something that they usually copy the first example from the docs and if the first example is the thing that you shouldn't do and the follow-up examples are the stuff that you should do then often people just like start with this and then they copy paste it into all their projects and then the world goes bad. So we don't wanna do that. So instead um, we use these new docs, which will soon be the default docs, which shows uh, the, a better box to copy. But there are even better things that follow. Okay, so um, maybe just a short uh, check here. Is there anybody um, who has a question about like the setup or who couldn't get like stuff to run, like things like this in that case? Uh, please let me know. And I'm also gonna, uh, maybe I'm also gonna put, I'm gonna uh, stop the screen share real quick to restart my Slack and then put the contents into Slack itself so that if people were too lazy to type, I can um, put this into Slack for copy pasting. Andreas, do we have any questions so far in the chat maybe because I, I couldn't pay attention to the chat. Uh, while, none so uh, far, uh, just uh, one remark agreeing about the first example of the async docs being bad. Okay. So. Uh, and someone asking to push the code intermittently to uh, GitHub. Yeah, I can do that as well. I'm gonna start with a Slack real quick here because I have that open already. 
So this is code listing number one in Slack, and I'm gonna push this as well, okay. Maybe I make a branch here, a live tutorial. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, I've done that. And now I'm just gonna Great, restart my screen share. Share. Participants list. Okay, great. So I've pushed it to GitHub uh, to the live tutorial branch so you can follow along there if you like. Okay, good. So now let's start with the improved docs and I will now do a very boring thing, which is uh, reading along those docs. Um, but I want to use you guys as uh, my like, experiment to see where the docs are clear, okay? So what does async do? This module provides a set of operations for running IO operations asynchronously, very important, right? We run IO, we do not do pure code. Uh, speed up. Like if we, I don't know, compute some Fibonacci numbers or whatever, that is pure. That's not what async is for. It's for doing IO based stuff and waiting for the results. So it's a thin layer over the basic concurrency operations provided by control concurrence. So what Haskell comes with already. Um, and it's written by the way, by, uh, by Simon Marlowe, who is also the author of the Haskell runtime system. So he also wrote all this internal stuff that he improves upon with this library. So the main additional functionality that it provides is the ability to wait for the return value of a thread, as opposed to just starting a thread and making it do some imperative stuff. But the interface also provides some additional safety and robustness over fork IO, which is the low level primitive. We'll look at this later. Fork IO threads and MVAR, which is another primitive to store or values across threads directly. So we look at the high level API and that says async's high level API spawns lexically scoped threads, um, ensuring the following key properties that make it safer to use than the plain fork IO. So lexically scoped means like the, the lifetime of your thread is clear from the lifetime of the like variables involved, which is not true for fork IO or any kind of low level primitive. Let's say if you spawn a thread with like a fork or POSIX spawn or like P thread create or whatever they are called, right? Then they just start and they're running somewhere in the background. And if you have a handle on them with a variable, that's great. And if you don't, then you may just like leak them and lose them. Okay, so property number one, no exception is swallowed. So this means that if you wait for some result and the thread that was supposed to compute that results throws some form of exception or failure, then this exception or failure will bubble up to you. You will notice there is no silent failure. Silent failure, you probably know, is bad and Haskell is a language designed very much to avoid any form of uh, silent failure. Um, property one, no exception is swallowed, no silent failure. Property two, no thread is leaked. So that means left running unintentionally. What can happen, I will show that later with the low level API is that you can spawn something and then you kind of lose track of it. And then it just keeps running in your background without you actually knowing. And it might, I don't know, download stuff or print stuff to your terminal when you don't want anything to be printed or prevent your application from shutting down on control C and stuff like this. Async prevents that too. These are the two properties. Internally, this is done using the bracket pattern uh, to work in the presence of synchronous and asynchronous exceptions. I'll talk a bit about those as well. So most practical production code should use only the high level API on not lower level stuff. Okay. Um, uh, you can ask questions both via audio um, and the chat, but uh, definitely just go ahead, like unmute yourself and ask questions whenever you have one. You can interrupt me. Okay, I guess this is an invitation for me to continue talking so that this interrupting can actually be tested. Um, so, yeah. I don't have a question right now, but nice to know. Good, okay. Um, the basic type that we're dealing with in here 
is the async A, which represents the an asynchronous IO action that will eventually return something of type A, which could be like a text in our example, right? Um, an async is a wrapper around this low level fork IO thing um, that creates this internal thread. The fundamental function to spawn these threads is with this high level API is with async. So for example, if you want to download two web pages at the same time, we can do this assuming that we have a suitable get URL function, which we handily have already crafted, which is this. We say, and I'm going to copy that over in the code here. Um, let's put that down here. Comment out this stuff here so that that doesn't run. We do with async get URL, and then we gave it to these texts, right? Get URL one and get URL two. And each of these ones, starts this computation and then gives us some handle of type, in this case, async, whatever that thing returns, get URL, which is a text. So this is async text in this case. I can annotate it if I want to. Um, and of course, I also import control concurrent async in that case. Okay. Um, and I also add async to the cabal file if I haven't done that already. Um, it gives us this handle and then we can operate with that handle. And in this case, we spawn two of such handles to download your one and two, and then we get these two handles in scope. And then we can say, now that we have started them both, now we wait for both of them uh, to complete. And in this case, I first wait for the first one and then I wait for the second one. And then I get their variables in scope and then I can print them. Let's check if this is correct, almost. Um, to do that, I need to do um, scoped type. Let me just be lazy and just copy it here. It's not really necessary in that case, but this is page one and page two here. Okay. Right. Okay, so I have these two things in here. I'm gonna kill the type annotation again. It's not really necessary. Just wanted to show that this really has this type. And then I can run main. And then we can see that it's now downloading these two things in parallel and they both like count up their counters and then they're both done and then I get the things down here and I got a 2x speed up in this case, right? So they're running in parallel now and that is nice. Okay. So with async starts this operation in a separate thread and then wait, this function here, waits for and returns that result. We have a quick look at the types of these functions again, just for certainty. With async takes the IO action that you wanna run and then gives you um, a continuation or a callback or whatever you wanna give it in which you have access to that handle and you can do some more IO computations which will then eventually be returned. So that is what we do here. We give this function, the IO thing and then the second argument which is this callback in which we operate. Um, that's that. And then wait takes such an async and just like blocks until that thing is done and then returns that IOA that we want to uh, work on the text in our case. Okay, good. So what does it do in terms of our two properties above? So if the operation um, that we execute throws an exception, in this case, let's say get URL, then that exception is rethrown by wait. Like when we wait on something and that thing inside had some issue, that gets rethrown here, essentially. That ensures property number one, no exception is swallowed. If an exception bubbles up through a with async, so like from inside here, like either from here or from the thing inside, um, then the uh, async that was spawned along the way, those asyncs are canceled. So that ensures property number two, no thread is leaked. So this means if I start multiple things in parallel and one of them fails, this allows me to make the entire bunch of things that I'm doing fail together as one thing. For example, I'm writing a build system, I'm downloading 100 files that I need to compile. If one of those files does not download, then I cannot produce the end result and they should all fail then. So um, that's what async does. Good. The next thing then is um, 
often that we do not often we don't care to work manually with these like async handles right in this case we're just like uh, having a one and a two and we wait for them we don't really want to do anything we just want to eventually get to the two pages right so instead we want to express high level objectives like performing two or more tasks concurrently and then waiting for one of them or multiple of them like either for one of them or all of them to finish usually so for example the pattern of performing two IO actions concurrently and waiting for both uh, of their results is packaged up by this concurrently combinator. So we can shorten this above thing to this here. Let's do that. And of course, these are strings again. Let's comment this out. Blop, blop, copying. There we go. Blop, blop. And running there we go does the same thing okay um, good nicholas yep i have a question that's willem here um where can we find the new documentation that you're reading is that available that, yeah that is if you go to the github page here and on the readme i've linked it otherwise it's nh2.me slash async minus docs okay so that Thanks. thing shown down here Mm -hmm. Okay, so you should get the same output exactly like that. Um, that's that. Okay. So we've done this part here. Now we want to, everything has worked so far, right? We've downloaded the two things and like this kind of with failure and whatnot, we haven't really seen that yet because we haven't had any failure so far. Let's introduce some failure, some transient failure into in the downloading. For example, let's say, after like one second has passed, right, we insert an error. So we can say here, for example, um, that we want to throw an, an, an error. Let's say when we are downloading uh, URL one, for example, then we just raise an exception and I'm just using the error function here to raise an exception, like um, download failure, or like let's say uh, connection aborted. Uh, for uh, uh, your uh, like this, so I import control honored when to have the when function. Let's put that in here, and we also have in line 19. Sorry, when the URL is this, then we throw this error. Okay, good. Let's try this. Okay, here we can see both started, but now of course only URL one had this had this problem. But we can see that now instead of the second one uh, of this of the failure and the first one being silent and the second one uh, just continuing, and then later I would see okay something like didn't work or what. I can now see immediately as soon as this exception is raised both of them are aborted because they run concurrently they run together and they fail together and i see this and i do not get any result down here exactly as i had intended okay um, that is a simulated failure in this case now also wanted to show one specific thing that in most cases you don't have to deal with a like with async and wait directly but uh, you remember that somewhere i said that um, the exception is rethrown by weight and i just want to prove that real quick that that is really the case let's switch back to this code here Plop. okay let's do uh, main again okay that still happens exactly the same way right we call wait first and like because that's the first thing we wait on as soon as that weight sees the exception stuff is aborted but now if i like make the second one fail instead with with async let's reload and we run then we can see that in this case like the first one which doesn't fail continues running to completion even though the first one has already stopped apparently and my exception is only raised afterwards right why is that because we first down here wait for a1 so that waits until a1 completes successfully so this entire line works without exception and only 
when the weight here happens is this exception re-raised. That's why we see this output. So if you want to build something that behaves like this, then you can get that behavior this way. But with, in most cases, you don't want that. In that case, concurrently is the right thing for you. Because that exits immediately, no matter which one we use. Okay, so that's important to know. Okay, good. Let's continue a bit with the tutorial. Sorry, another question. Have you yeah. pushed this to GitHub? Because it's not. Yeah, I will do that. Yeah, please remind me sometimes of that. Let's call this, uh, what did we do? Uh, introducing. Well, okay. Great. Now, um, that was concurrently. And then this section in the docs, high level utilities further down, and you can click that uh, here, high level utilities, covers the most common high level objectives, including waiting for two results. We did that, that was concurrently. Waiting for many results, more than two, for example. Then we can use map concurrently and for concurrently. Waiting for the first of two results and like canceling the second one, and we're happy with the first one that completes, that is race. And waiting for arbitrary nestings of this like logic of all of N or the first one of N using the concurrently new type and its applicative and alternative instances. Now that sounds already a little bit more sophisticated, so we will make some examples. First, the by far most common case, map concurrently and for concurrently. Let's, let's use them. So let's say we have a couple of URLs. Um, let's make a couple of URLs where we say um, that URLs is equals URL one, URL two, URL three, sorry. Okay, URL four, like that. And then we say we want to run, essentially we want to do like map, map M over um, these URLs and we want to map M the function get URL like that. Let's see if that is correct. I guess we get the results also like uh, uh, pages, print pages. Okay, so now they run in serial, but instead I can say um, map concurrently, which has the same type as map M in this case, just that, that um, it does it in parallel. So map concurrently, okay. And I will also comment out the failure because we want to see it succeed for now. And it starts them all in parallel. And we obtain the list of parallelly downloaded contents. If I put the failure back, you see it works as expected and fails them all. After the first one fails, there we go. The exception bubbles up. So map concurrently. So now I have a question yep. about this. No. Yep. Can we just indiscriminately always use map concurrently or is you know, should we limit it by maybe the number of sockets or something like that? Yeah, that comes a little bit later. So right now we are basically assuming that it is correct to run all of these things in the list in parallel, but there may be situations where that's not good. For example, if this list has like a billion entries, right? Then maybe we will run out of RAM or out of sockets, or maybe it's just like, more than is sensible to run because our internet connection can't deliver that, this kind of stuff. We will look at uh, some methods to limit the parallelism uh, a little bit later. And the second question. Um, I only had one question. Did someone else have no, a question? No, I think two people no, I were, think talking two people were talking at this time. Yeah. Okay, maybe it was already resolved. Let me just check here. Okay, 
Good. Now, um, for concurrently, it's the same thing with the argument flipped. And um, that is just when you want to do something in here, usually. So let's just uh, compile this and check. Uh, okay. And that's just when you then like get a URL and then you run or write some code in line, like here, let's say like this, right? That's often you define some list or you get some inputs via command line and you want to do something and then you write it in line. So that's that's usually how you write it with for concurrently. That's the way that you would usually see it in production code. Okay, so that part we have covered. Um, now we want to have, uh, that's these two, right? Now we want to do race. So let's do, let's modify our function a little bit. Um, let's do like get your, uh, I don't know, uh, with duration and we give it an int that just says how many, uh, uh, how long it takes, uh, seconds or something like this. And then we say a starting whatever. And then we say uh, for one, two uh, seconds, we can do thread delay one second and we say how many seconds have passed like this um, s seconds have passed and then we are done and return it let's see if that's right let's import four underscore Okay, um, let's see what else we have here, 38 says, oh yeah, sorry, this needs to be a text because I'm using say which prints texts, not strings. So I import the text um, as t and I t.pack this string. Okay, there we go. And now we can say, let's let's comment this out again. And I get URL with du duration, let's say this one takes five seconds and this is URL one. And um, this is like, I want to like run two of these with race. And the first argument is the first thing to run. And the second argument, let's say is URL two and we expect that this will only take three seconds to run. That's URL two. What does race return us? Let's look it up. Race returns an either whether the left or the right one finished first. Okay. So let's call this like either result. And then we can say, uh, let's print that e result like that. Okay. Let's run that. We see these two things start. And um, the second one here is already done. So we get a right because it's the second one and otherwise it would be a left with the URL two having finished and we get these contents back and then we can like case on the result, for example, and do something with them. The first one wins in race as the name implies. The second one gets canceled. You can see that URL one, the last thing it printed was this and then it disappears. Okay, um, so far so good. Um, and then finally, want to look at uh, this nested stuff, right? Doing arbitrary stuff with the concurrently new type. So let's click here and it's applicative and alternative instances. Here's an example. Let's just copy it lazily again and then we look at it. Maybe I do the pushing again. Okay. High level functions. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, for this case, I'm just gonna assume some familiarity with uh, uh, the applicative and alternative instances. The key thing is that you take an IO action that, that you want to run, and then uh, concurrently is just a new type that you can wrap around that IO action. So for example, it would be a concurrently IO text if we run this around get URL, then yeah, this thing is a concurrently IO text. And then we can say we use um, 
applicative notation. So I'm just going to format that like a little bit differently in this case, maybe like that, so that we can see what the arguments are. Okay. So I make these three concurrently thingies, each of them being an, a concurrently, like one of them is a concurrently IO uh, text. Then I F map using the F map operator and the applicative application star, this triple over it. So this will return me a, a concurrently, the entire thing here, let's bracket this here, down to here, will be a concurrently IO text, text, text. Uh, this will be this triple here, like that. Okay. And then with I one concurrent. I, I think you don't yes. need the IO in there because it's confusing. Uh, sorry, say again. I think you don't need that IO in there, just concurrently text. Oh, is that correct? Because if I wrap. Uh, oh, yeah, I think you're right. Of course, yeah, it has this. Yeah. Uh, concurrently A has the IO in there. Sorry, this should be, uh, should just should just have this one here. It's a concurrently text, yes. Okay, thanks, Cyril. And then um, run concurrently, runs that thing, oops, uh, down here, right? If I uh, run this thing on the concurrently, then an IOA will come out and it will wait for all of them to have finished. I'm gonna undo the typing here so that it looks nice and clear. Page one, two, three, and let's copy some of our page printing stuff like that. One, two, three, blop, 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 blop. And here they go. Let's comment out the failure. Up here. And here they run. Okay. And then we have all the contents. So far, that's that. And now I can say, but now I want to have that URL2. Let's say we have URL to A and URL to B because we download them from different servers and we just want to get the one that finishes first. So we can say, let's run them and we run, one of them shall finish first with a race. We put a race inside essentially. And there we can use the alternative uh, operator uh, so that one of them finishes first. So that's URL to B in this case. Let's put that there. And when, you use the alternative, then only one of them will finish. So that will be just page two in that case uh, that that gets returned. So let's do that here. And we need to import uh, control applicative, the alternative operator. Okay. We run this, it starts them all and then it finishes with URL to A was first, okay? And then of course, inside here again, I could do again some arbitrary nestings of let's say stars again, right? So then I could put something in here and then uh, again, combine them with, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, I could like tuple stuff up here again with like a tuple operator and then uh, this and then, sorry, put this thing, put this thing in here again, if I wanted to, but I don't do that now. I think it's clear already that you can do this arbitrary nesting of things that you want to do in parallel. So this thing essentially builds some kind of like execution tree, you could say, right? Where like you, on each tree level, you can say whether things are um, things that have to finish together or things that have to race against each other. And yeah, that way you can, uh, that way you can uh, express these arbitrary things. And you can also use multiple of these to make n many things run and have the first one of them finish, for example. So that is essentially the API. And with con concurrently, you can do pretty much everything that you need to do in practice, and it's gonna be nice and safe. Okay. Um, and I think that is it for the high level docs so far. So we were here. 
So how do you find this? You click on the right high level utilities and then you have race uh, things that like don't return, like return any results. You just say, I want to run them and rely on the side effects to do something, a map concurrently for concurrently and concurrently itself. They're all here. Okay. This was the part where we go through um, the API essentially and the new tutorial. So the first question, what I want to get out of this is, uh, did any, did all of this make sense? Do you find that there are any open questions after going through this tutorial in terms of how async itself works? Yeah, it made total sense, was super clear. I have maybe two small questions. Yeah. Um, one is, um, maybe you have that plan for later, but an obvious use case, if one of the um, branches fails, how do I get that information out again so that maybe I can keep a list of URLs that fail so I can try them again? That's question mm -hmm. number one. So, so usually if you care about failure, then you should implement the handling of this failure inside of your function that you want to uh, run inside of your IO function. So let's say somewhere this uh, like get URL uh, is the function that can fail, right? I could make a like uh, uh, get URL um, like or complain function mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah. then can do this and then can let's say it takes the URL and then you would use the functions from control exceptions such as try that tries to get the thing, gives me an either, and then I could case on that either where I can say, okay, either it's a left and it didn't work and I like, there's an error message and then I can do something with it or it's like the the, the right with the success result X and then I can, uh, I don't know, uh, return X uh, or handle it in any way. So you should do this, this catching of like individual failures uh, on, around the function that can like exhibit the individual failure. And then you can of course like make a wrapper around it and then you can like say, you could return either's for example, right? And then your result that you would get instead of getting the actual page contents, like pages here, you would get a, a list of um, either's and then you can print the result and say these ones failed, these ones didn't fail. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, my second, uh, question, my second question was actually about, um, the tuples, but I think um, it's clear that you can also just map it over a list of things because as, as soon as tuples get a bit longer, it's a bit inelegant. That, that's um, correct, yes. So you can okay. use any of the functions that you can use on things that are like applicative and alternative. So for example, if we go to, let me go to uh, concurrently again, and then um, it says down here that we can use these things that are yeah, applicatives and alternatives, right? And mm -hmm. these also have convenient functionality to deal with lists. So uh, for example, there is, if I click alternative and I go into the dogs, okay, maybe I will do um, the ones from base here. Um, there. Okay, and then we have, for example, um, let's see where we have something useful here. Um, let's see where, oh no, sorry. It's probably um, maybe here. Yeah, let's use this. So this is in data foldable in this case. So for example, a sum, right, is like the, uh, alternative operator, so like the, the pipe operator here, applied to a list or a foldable, let's say a list, a vector, anything that I can fold over and putting these things in between. And then I can say, for example, a sum of, uh, uh, let's get URL something, something, something. And because it uses the alternative implementation, then the first one of that one will be returned. And similarly, I can use like a for, for example, to create myself an applicative. And then I could say, um, I can stick instead of this explicit tuple here, I could put a like a four, make myself the uh, URL one, two, and three, and then like create, create, this, uh, create this with an arbitrary length input. 
and yeah, you can play around a bit with that if you want to try it out. Um, okay, so thanks. any of these things generalizes to arbitrary sized, like not uh, compile time known length things, vectors, lists, and so on. And that makes the interface very nice. Cool. Okay. I had a quick question. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, let me just say uh, a quick comment and a, and a question as well. Um, Nicholas, are you going to uh, uh, compare it to the approach taken in the Unleafio with the run concurrently? If uh, not, uh, maybe just mentioning the overhead that is involved in the every call race and concurrently would be a good idea. I will do hell, have a little bit of uh, unlift IO stuff later, but that might be a thing that we can discuss afterwards. I don't talk about the implementation overhead because this is mainly a usage tutorial, but maybe Alexi, that's something that you can say a couple words uh, at the end of because I think it may be interesting to some people, yes. Absolutely. Just, just remind me at the end. I'm just gonna put this down here, like, um, let's put this here. Uh, let's put this down out here, maybe. Um, Alexi, two men. Uh, starting overhead, perhaps. Okay. Okay. And another question was somewhere in the room. Yeah. Um, what's the behavior of alternative um, for concurrently if you have exceptions in one of the alternatives, like if they come like very soon or later? Oh, it should bubble up in that case. We can try that real quick by putting. Um, the failure into the URL 2A, let's say here, URL 2A, and then it should, it should abort, I think. Let's see. Yeah, it aborts as expected. If you do not want it to abort, then you need to catch the exception around here using try, um, catch, bracket, and so on. Yeah, but if it would, if it should fail like in three seconds, after the first one finishes, then it won't trigger or one. That is correct, yes. If something gets canceled before it has the chance to fail, then of course it will not trigger, yeah. So let's say if URL 2B is much faster than URL 2A can manage to fail, then this will get canceled before it can even get to the situation where something fails. That is correct. And I think that also makes sense that it works this way, right? If you don't, if you don't actually download don't do your entire download operation, then you will not notice whether at the end of the download something would fail because I don't know, your disk is full or whatever. Yeah, sure, thanks. I have thanks. a related question. So you yeah. showed yeah. Um, you showed with the, that wait is the thing that rethrows the exception. Um, and so what happened, so I, I saw this combinator link to, uh, does does that allow us to let like the other weight also uh, already bubble up the exception? Or? Yes, there there's some advanced async functionality that you can use. Let me just go back here, uh, link two for example, or or link, and um, with this you can say when you have some specific asyncs, like and one of them cancels, please also send a cancellation to another one. So with that you can build more complex constructs. But um, that's something that's a little bit more advanced than the, than the talk that I'll get over here. And you will also have to do some like rigorous testing whether uh, it works as you expect. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question. Yeah. Um, do you think these uh, concurrently uh, new type is enough for or would you in your code, would you use a concurrently type uh, all the time, or would you still use the the race and wait and async or with async primitives? So th these, like the other ones, are essentially like shorter ways to write this kind of stuff. In practice, when I have some things where it's really like two or it's really just n, then for concurrently, for example, is the thing that I would reach to as opposed to, let's say, making run concurrently and then lots of concurrentlys, simply because it's easier to read and it's more obvious, right? Instead of having some simple, let's say a non-parallel for, like the for function from data traversable, you would have for concurrently and you have a minimal change to your code. That's why I would usually use the simpler helper functions around the more complex ones, yes, instead of the more complex ones when I don't need them. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that makes sense. Um, 
and related to that, uh, the linking thing, is that still needed with a c concurrently new type? Or because it seems to, to be a bit more limited in that. So, I mean, in practice, I have not, I think I've had one situation in my life so far where I needed to use link, where I wanted to build something like very specific, where I wanted to have like an async style API across computations that can be made across multiple machines, where I wanted to build myself an async that works like multi-machine, cross-machine and distributed systems. That was the only case where I ever had to use something like link. Beyond that, like the concurrently new type uh, with perhaps like a couple of exception rep handlers inside the URLs, uh, inside the get URL or the functions that I want to run was always enough for me. All right, good to know. All right. I guess one other use case is, uh, I just want to remember something like this, is when you want to start a worker um, that helps your main code, but this worker is never supposed to exit, and then if it exits, you also want to cancel your main code and just throw an error and crash, because it is not supposed to happen. Yeah, so maybe this is also a thing that we can, uh, that we can maybe talk about as well. So starting something that runs in the background, for example, of your web server is also something that with async can be very useful for, right? So you may have something like, uh, let's say you have, uh, let's say you use the sort, right? As the, as the web server, then you can say, let's say with async, and then you can have here like a uh, run background polling thread that, uh, pulls jobs from DB according to the German naming convention. This is the function that we would run. And then inside here, you would have, let's say, a start ESOT web server, for example, right? So then this would run in the background. And then if you say press control C or you send the web server uh, the request to shut down, then the outer thing would also be shut down. If you have one or two things that need to be started, um, then with async, uh, is the right thing. Uh, that's one of them, for example. But you could alternatively, you could also, if you know that both technically run forever, equally uh, sensible would be race in that case. So then you can say like, I want to race that and I want to run, let's say, uh, this, this, this other thing in here, right? And then maybe you ignore the, the either returned and you raise these two things. That's also possible. I guess the difference is like, you would use the first one again only if somewhere in your web server, you want to do something with this handle A1, right? So for example, that you can, I don't know, cancel the, cancel the background thread or something like this inside there. So in most cases you don't need it. Um, in, in that situation where you have a background thread, um, how, is there any way to make them communicate with the main thread? I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to wait on them. Yes, supposed to run to that, that is correct. Yeah, there are multiple ways how you can have multiple threads communicate with, with each other. That may be not like full contents for this, for this talk. I can show some quick ones because it's probably interesting to know and like where you can read on. There are multiple ways that you can com communicate across threads. Uh, maybe I also do a bit more if the rest fits like in the time and depending on what people are interested in. But there are multiple ways you can do that. So for example, there, there are IO refs, uh, IO ref, um, and IO refs are probably the simplest method, um, IO ref in this case, which is a mutable variable that you can uh, use across threads, data.io ref. You can make a new IO ref, for example, you say a, a new, new IO ref and you can say it shall contain a four and that's my ref, right? And then inside some thread, you can always write something like, uh, uh, let's say a read IO ref, my ref, and then this will give you an X where the X would be four in this case. You can also use write IO ref to write something to it. And importantly, you can run a modification function, modify IO ref that takes a function that says, for example, plus one on the thing. And key thing then there is that there is the uh, atomic modifier of IO ref, for example, that takes an IO ref and you provided a pure function that gets the old value 
and then you can compute what the new value is supposed to be that you put in the left side of the tuple and then you can compute some other value for example if something got updated or whatnot that you want to return or you can also return unit here if you don't care about it and then that gets returned and with atomic modify io ref you can make sure that like each of them runs and they like are safe against each other you never lose any info if you do two write io refs at the same time then they may let's say if you use read io ref and write io ref and make the decision between those two then they might uh, interleave in such a way that they um, override each other's data. Uh, let's say the classical example of a database system where uh, you like make a transaction or multiple transactions and you will just increase somebody's account by $100. Then if you first just have two things, two threads that read that the guy currently has $200 and then they both run in parallel the increase by $100, then you might end up with $300 even though both transaction individually together or running after each other would have resulted in $400, right? Atomic modify IORF is the safe function that you should always use when dealing with these IORFs. They are the simplest and fastest multi-thread uh, uh, or cross-thread state variable. We have some other ones such as the MVAR, which is uh, the MVAR here, which is in um, control concurrent MVAR. And the MVARs are things, are essentially IO refs that are like always safe by default, you could say, but they can also block. They are a one, you could say like a one semaphore essentially, a field, a, a value with a lock around it. You can say, I make myself an empty MVAR. Let's say you can make a new empty MVAR. And then you can take that MVAR, and let's call this a VAR in this case then. You can do uh, take MVAR and this will block until that MVAR contains something. And then you can put put MVAR and then you put into that VAR, you put a four, for example. And then if that if it starts as empty and one thread blocks on it, then it waits until it's full. And if some other thread puts something in, then this thing like unblocks and continues with the value and it takes it out. Uh, so another thread would then block again. So these are things, if you wanna wait for certain results, then that's uh, what you can use for that. And uh, we may also use that in a moment when I show uh, fork IO, the underlying primitive, and what its problems are and how you could use that to simulate what async does, but in a more unsafe fashion. That's number two, right? So uh, I'm actually gonna write this as things here, like uh, cross-thread communications. Uh, we can say we have the IO ref, we have the MVAR, then we have also the channels, so it's a chan, and if you're a Go programmer, then you may find that nice. Um, it's a chan here, and then um, control concurrent chan. That is essentially an MVAR that can have multiple things. You can push multiple things in that channel, and then you can pull multiple things out of the channel. And if you try to pull from an empty channel, then you're blocking uh, multi-element MVAR. Okay, and then you also have uh, then STM. And STM is software transactional memory, which provides like various types of variables and other cool functionality by which you can run like entire atomic functions that you can compose, like transaction-like stuff as you would do in a database. You can say, change this variable by that, that variable by that, and that variable that, but roll back the entire thing if any of these things fails, for example. That's what STM can do, and it's also very useful, but that is too much detail for this call. Okay, um, good. Any more questions? Otherwise, I would go to some exceptions. Okay, let's do it. So we have already shown one case of exceptions where something just raises an exception from inside, right? Like this error here, or you may also know throw IO. This is what's called a synchronous exception. It gets raised by the code itself um, that runs and then raises this exception from inside. There are also in Haskell asynchronous exceptions that get raised from somewhere else. And they are very interesting. So for example, we, made say, we might say we want to run, what was it? Get URL, uh, URL one and we get the page and we print the page and we check that it compiles and it does. And then we can say, we want to do that and it takes three seconds, but we want to time out it, time out and we give it maximally 
um, let's say five seconds, all right? So let's say five, uh, let's give it one dot, one dot five seconds. So one five zero 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 milliseconds. That's the timeout function, uh, timeout. Here we go. And that returns a maybe. If the thing finished within the day, maybe uh, within the timeout, it's going to be a just. Otherwise, it's going to be a nothing. Let's run that here and get system timeout imported. Like that. Let's run that. And we can see uh, that we still raise this exception, which I don't want to do. Okay, so you see like this thing takes three seconds. We timed out after 1.5 seconds. So this thing returns a nothing and then the whole thing stops. How does this work? The timeout function itself starts a thread that sleeps this long and afterwards and in parallel also starts this thing. You could imagine that it does this with async but because it's in the base library, it implements that manually. And after this sleep, it kills that other thread. It cancels it. Um, exactly as like things get canceled further up here, right? In this case, uh, this cancellation and also with async, the cancellation works in the way that an exception is thrown not from the code itself, but an exception is thrown to that other thread. And that exception can then rise in any of the functions involved, any of the code involved, any of the lines involved, you could say. So it can look like that while we are in the second sleep in this case, that that sleep itself then kind of raises this exception when it gets interrupted by this exception where it was thrown to it, even though the function thread delay itself is super benign and it doesn't have any functionality to throw stuff itself, right? The runtime system raises the exception thrown, that thread, thrown to that thread for you. So this means that when you write any form of code, you must always be aware that somewhere, somebody else who calls your code may have wrapped it in a timeout. So this means any of your code in any line could raise some exception. And you kind of need to be prepared for that. That is important, otherwise your code might be wrong. In this case, our very benign code is not wrong because if let's say this thread delay here throws, then we just don't do the following things and there isn't really any big problem with that. But there can be problems with that if this thing has some kind of mutable state, right? That we assume we start, we set to something during get URL and then we have to unset it in the end. And um, that, that, that is very important to get right. So for example, let's say we um, uh, create a file that we want to delete, a temporary file during the download. If you then get interrupted in the end and don't delete the file, then your disk might get full if that happens a couple of times, right? Or you create a file descriptor, for example, um, for downloading something, uh, maybe with the foreign function interface or you malloc or free some stuff and so on. Anything that does resource allocation, which requires resource deallocation, you may want to ensure that your resource deallocation actually happens. And similarly, you may be running a thread and then the exception that gets thrown to you is the cancel exception that uh, is thrown by the async to you, right? By the async library. These things are important. And uh, let's simulate that real quick. It's a little bit tangential to uh, this uh, async programming stuff, but in practice, these two things always uh, interact with each other. That's why I want to show how it goes. So let's do, we say here that we like, uh, let's let's make a resource here. Um, let's do a data resource. Uh, we just make ourselves a fa fake resource. Let's say a file descriptor. Okay, and now we say um, uh, ac acquiring file descriptor, and then we do something with the file descriptor. So let's say we just make it up out of thin air here, right? So let's say uh, fd is a file descriptor, and then at the end we do a freeing file descriptor. Um, deallocating file descriptor. And just imagine that we called some extra function that cleaned up that file descriptor, like closing the TCP connection or whatever. Imagine that happens in there and that, that we need this FD here to, uh, to, to use it in this downloading. Let's say uh, starting with FD and then we can put here uh, t.pack show FD in here and we derive uh, deriving uh, eq ord and show so we can call show on it uh, so far so good so we can do that now but now if we run this 
we can see that we allocate the FD, right? And then one second has passed, but this thing, this deallocation function uh, is not called. So if this thing is something that takes some resources on a system, disk space, RAM, something that's constrained like the by default thousand file descriptors that the program can run on Linux, for example, that can own, then this is bad because we have now leaked this thing and they will only be cleaned up when the entire process actually exits. Um, so that's not good. We want to make sure that this thing always runs, no matter if an asynchronous exception like the one from timeout uh, kills our thing. So what we do for that is that we use a function from a control exception, which is called bracket. And with bracket, this is called the bracket pattern, you can say what are things that I want to do to create some resources in the beginning. And what are things to clean up and what are the things that I want to run in the middle. So the first thing is like uh, create resource. This is the function that will free the resource. Uh, and that, that is the function that is do something with the resource. Okay. So in this case, we want to say uh, up here, for example, the thing that we run here is we say like do acquiring file descriptor and then we return the file descriptor. And then I'm going to show the type of the bracket function real quick. A uh, type of the bracket function um, is this. Loading, loading. The, the first argument creates this resource, which is the A. And then the second function is the one that cleans it up. It has access to the things. So let's say a file descriptor, it gets given that file descriptor so that this function then can, for example, can, can close on it or free or whatever the cleanup function is. And then this is the function to run between that runs on that resource that does something with it. So let's implement that. So create resource, we've done that. Uh, I'm gonna move this up here for clarity. And then freeing the resource in this case is just that I say, um, it's just that I say for freeing, I just do this, uh, print this say deallocating resource and it gets as an argument, gets this FD. And in this case, uh, maybe I do something with it and I just say which thing I'm freeing, p.pack uh, show FD like that. Okay. So that we see, okay, we just do a print as a placeholder function for the actual free. And then uh, the actual function that I want to run here is then the rest that does something with that FD and that is this stuff. Okay, so this has now access to the FD and we, we use it here. Okay, and now we can run that. And remember, um, we cancel this thing after 1.5 seconds, let's run it. And we can see that now the thing gets canceled and we are now deallocating that thing. So bracket makes sure that this code here is run even if a asynchronous or synchronous exception gets raised. If I switch back to this thing and disable the timeout, then the same thing will still happen. So you see, it still says deallocating the file descriptor also if it's a synchronous exception. Sorry. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Is this, uh, is bracket strictly superior to finally? Uh, bracket can do more than finally. Um, finally is also a function in control exception. Um, and it has a very similar shape here, as you can see, but it doesn't have a callback. So for example, the thing that uh, runs afterwards in this case, even if an exception was raised, doesn't really have access to the thing. So for example, with finally, you wouldn't be able to implement something that does uh, a malloc and free, for example, for, for C code, because free requires that you give it the thing to be freed, but here your cleanup function doesn't really get given any argument, right? So in that case, right. in yeah. It's a simpler function that can do slightly less things, but if you can use it because you do less things, then it can look cleaner because it has one argument less and a simpler, a simpler type. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's put this here. Uh, it, it is related, but what if I wanted to uh, have, I, I, let's say I have 100 asynchronous operation and I just want to count how many will fail, but continue. Uh, till the end. 
Yeah. So then what you would have to do in this case, and do you want to obtain this number only at the very end or do you need to have access to that number already while the things are running? Well, and, uh, I, would say I will answer both cases actually. Of okay, so thank you. <laughs> um, the, if you need it only at the end, then you just use the thing that I showed before, what Willem was asking, when um, you just wrap this in a try and then instead of returning a text, you return, let's say a maybe text or an either text where the either could contain the error message or something like this. And then you can just, you just get like say a hundred either string texts or something like this. And then you just count how many things are left, how many things are right, that's at the end. If you need to have access to this information already while your operations are running, then you need to use one of these uh, uh, cross thread variables where you can say you implement a try or catch or whatever that catches the exception of a failure and then writes this information, for example, into an IO ref and bumps it with atomic modify IO ref plus one or minus one when such when you observe such a failure in your handler for the exception. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that um, was the uh, yeah, with, please. With regards to these asynchronous exceptions, uh, the code you've shown is only correct under the assumption that only some functions can throw these, these asynchronous exceptions. Um, in particular, uh, in this case, I assume that they would be um, sent by the thread timeout, um, or whatever it's called, the waiting function. Because uh, otherwise, if, if it could just be thrown at any random point in the code, there's no guarantee that it couldn't be thrown before the bracket function itself. Um, so is there a list of the functions that can throw these asynchronous exceptions? No, you don't really need that because, I mean, in practice, what the bracket does, it, it ensures that these two things here, like the creation, the cleanup, that they cannot be interrupted by an asynchronous exception. You can turn in the same way as you can turn off interrupts at the low level in the CPU, you can turn off the exception delivery in the Haskell runtime system. So um, these, these, the creation, like the creation and the freeing of the resources uh, in the implementation of bracket have something that just says for the duration of this, of this running this and this just Runtime system, keep the exceptions for yourself and raise them only when I say that I want to receive exceptions again. And that would be run just, just before these things. And this is called masking and unmasking. So um, bracket itself then would be implemented, for example, with these masking and unmasking functions. And these two things would run in masked state and this thing would run in unmasked state. So that means you do not need to be careful with an exception like canceling, I don't know, for example, between these two lines because it runs in masked state. To make it even better, there is also interruptible mask and uninterruptible. Yeah, so there are some there are some more details then in terms of like how exactly this masking is implemented. But again, like on a high level, you almost never have to use mask and unmask yourself because you almost always can use bracket only if you are implementing things that are like bracket itself then you need to have access to these low level functions and then you, of course you need to be very careful with uh, what you're doing okay good so we have shown that here so now you know how to do things like with async and you know how exceptions work and that you need to be careful with them. And then of course, in, in combination, why do you need to know the bracket stuff, exception stuff for async? Because async uses exceptions to cancel the threads that are irrelevant. And if, for example, you have an op file, like a file descriptor, let's say you use the curl C library and then you create something that does the downloading for you, right? That thing needs to be canceled. So if you have a real get your function, that might be important to know. Okay. Now, talking a bit about how does this whole thing work under the hood? How does the RTS work? Um, and I'll just quickly explain this. The RTS, the Haskell RTS works uh, by default using uh, green threads. So you may already know that if you use like async or fork IO that you create very cheap threads that are cheaper than operating system threads. So on POSIX, for example, that would be the P threads. And it's an N on M green threading implementation. So this means you can have, for example, um, 
can have, for example, four cores, right? And a hundred green threads. And then the RTS would always schedule, like the hardware itself can only run four things truly in parallel. So it has a scheduler inside, similar to how the Linux kernel has a scheduler to schedule threads onto the actual cores. There's a scheduler inside that picks uh, green threads and says this green thread runs now for a bit of time slice on this actual POSIX thread that's running on the real CPU. Um, so that means operating system threads are expensive or more expensive. Haskell green threads are very cheap. So how expensive an operating thread is, operating system thread is, depends of course on um, the operating system, for example, on Windows, they're a bit more expensive and on Linux, they're a little bit cheaper. But you can, for example, without a big problem spawn, let's say 100,000 green threads in Haskell and it doesn't make a big problem. If you start um, 100,000 P threads or Windows threads, then you may have a problem because they all need a stack, for example, let's say a four kilobyte page, at least maybe multiple ones. So it may exhaust some memory, it may create some switching overhead between the threads and so on. Of course, you can also not create arbitrarily many green threads, right? Because you will have to at least remember where in the program flow um, that thing is, and you have, have to have at least some pointers to the variables that are like in scope or like on the heap and so on um, while that thing is running. So this means creating like millions or tens of millions of these threads probably isn't really advisable. And in many cases, it is also not necessary. Um, you can control how this thing, the, the threading works in the following. So first, um, you when you compile stuff, you usually have to tell, um, I use GHCI here in this case, right? And GHCI by default is, um, compiled with a threaded flag to implement this N on M green thread threading. If you want to use this for your compile program, then you usually say uh, threaded as the compile flag to GHC and uh, stack a build will build it for me. Okay. And then I can also tell the um, Haskell runtime how many like underlying operating th threads operating system threads I want to use. So in this case, my, my executable is here, right? And I can run it here. And um, I can then say plus RTS minus N4, for example, to start by default with um, four operating system threads. And these things are also called capabilities from the perspective of the Haskell runtime system. So with four capabilities, I can also pass just dash N, then it will auto detect it from how many CPUs I have. For example, H top here shows that I have uh, two uh, cores in that case. So it will set it to N2 by default. And if you want to set this in your thing, then you can pass uh, with RTS opts. Um, let me just check real quick if this has one, one minus or two. Um, and then you can say this should be, let's say minus N by default. And um, it's just a single minus, okay, with RTS opts. And then the compile program will by default do that. And um, this of course is more important when you use something that's CPU bound, right? If it's network bound, like we showed in this example, then even a single re operating system thread will still do you well because your just multiplexing over these multiple IO things that just take a while to do, but don't really consume your CPU. But yeah, such a setup is what you could give to automatically do that. Then you don't have to pass minus RTS plus uh, minus N. And then there are a couple of cooler N flags by now in newer GHCs where they automatically detect certain things. Let's say you can say, I want to use like auto detect a thing, but I want to cap it to let's say 24 threads because above 24 threads, my program doesn't really scale well anymore and like it just creates more overhead or what. And you can look that up in the GHC manual. Um, Okay, that's this. Now we go to why do we use async in the first place? Why don't we use the underlying primitives? What are the problems that they create? And how can you spot when some bad code uses them incorrectly? So the underlying primitive here is called fork IO. And fork IO by itself is not bad. It is just like low level and you must only use it if you really understand what it's doing. And it's the thing with which async itself is implemented. So fork IO returns some uh, or use, accepts this argument, an IO action that just performs a side effect. You see, it cannot return any value and it just gives you a thread ID, very similar to, let's say you could do like in, in C, for example. 
Um, and then you can do things with that thread ID if you want, you can print it. So for example, we could say, let's get the get URL again in that case. Um, and then we say fork IO, that thing, and then it returns us a thread ID. Let's say thread ID one, and then I just print the thread ID, okay? So printed one. If I run this, we will see that doesn't work because we give it something that returns an IO text um, and it, oh, we also haven't imported it. Sorry, let's do that first. Uh, control concurrent, let's just make this a little bit more ordered here. Um, fork IO. There we go. So it says now, okay, um, you give me an IO text, but I want an IO unit as advertised in the docs, right? So I can't really return this thing out of this function. So let's just get the uh, thing here, which is the page one, and then we uh, like return unit. We don't return anything. Maybe we instead just print it, print page one, right? Let's print page one. This compiles and then, so this starts this thread number one, and then let's do this again with a thread number two here, printing URL number two. Say like page. That. Page two. Uh, not, not print because that will, will be run concurrently, it will interleave. Yeah, but that's, I think that's what I intend, right? Uh, I want to run these two things like with fork IO independently, uh, concurrently next to each other. I think Alexei is saying you say instead of uh, print. Print, that, that's right. Ah, that's right. I see, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Okay, let's do that. Um, Let's do uh, say. Uh, you shouldn't have said anything, Alexei. That would have been funny. Show like this. Okay, like that. So if I run this now, let me just see that I've commented out the failure. Yes, that's correct. So you will observe something really odd here, which is that they start the stuff and then they print stuff in my GHCI prompt. I can type stuff here, but something is still running in the background. So that's certainly highly weird. and not what I want at all, right? This just messes around with my prompt. That's not what I want. And the problem with that is that here I just start two threads and these threads like start off and keep running and then immediately I execute this like printing the thread IDs and then my thing is done and it returns back to GHCI even though this runs in the in the background. So we have here this problem that I mentioned before which was um, the issue of um, uh, threads left running unintentionally, right? Thread leakage. I, I don't want to have that in that case, right? So that's what happens here. And if you compile the program, then all kind of weird shit can happen. For example, um, your program may just exit and you're like, where's my program, right? I started the stuff, it's just gone. Or your program may hang in certain situations where you want it to finish and it does not actually finish and it does not terminate um, then you like press control C like a madman and it's still running and you get really upset. Um, so that's what happens if you use fork IO in this case. You can then in this case, let me just put this here, let's just uh, commit this again. Uh, yeah. Uh, fork, fork IO example. You can simulate this waiting for results by using these mvars, right? Let's do that real quick. Uh, control concurrent mvar in this case. And we make two mvars, uh, var one, new m empty mvar, and var two, which is a new empty mvar. And then we can say the result, we put mvar into the var one, the page one, and we put mvar into var2, the page two. And then we can say, um, we uh, take mvar, take mvar var one, which gets us then the page one, and the same thing for page two. And then we print stuff again in the bottom. Good, now there was some, I didn't use page two, that's suspicious. Yeah, that's right. Good. And then if we do that, um, then you see, okay, my GHCI prompt does not appear and then it happens only at the end, right? So that's that. So now this apparently works. We no longer, no longer have this thread leakage, right? But if now I insert some exception up here, let's copy paste my, uh, my error function up here. So let's put that there. Let's put this 
let's say we put that here. Okay. And we can just uh, connection aborted for, yeah, that's good enough. Okay. Uh, what's happening now? Huh? Oh no, deadlock. <laughs> so in this case, like I get connection aborted here, but like the other thing happily continues running, right? And in this case, like um, I do get the stuff printed here, but then I get thread blocked indefinitely in an MVAR operation. And that's just some kind of exception over which I have no control at all, right? Why is that? Because I have this MVAR here and then I kind of want to put stuff in, but before I cancel, so this line gets never executed. This MVAR always stays empty. And then when I want to try to put this, like read the contents of it here, I will never be able, this will never return because it will hang forever, right? Nobody ever fills anything into VAR1. And in some very simple situations, GHC can detect that this will happen and then throw us an exception, but then we're lucky, right? In more complicated code, GHC may not be able to detect that. And then this code will sit there forever and wait. And your program will hang forever and no progress is made. Your service is down, you lose money. That's all not good. So that's why you don't use 4KO, right? Instead, you use async. Then these things are very clear. It has the notion of actually returning a value outside out of a parallel computation. And it's much easier than messing around with this stateful stuff. Yes, these were the examples of why uh, low level stuff here is bad. Let's commit this. Maybe before I commit it, I write why it's bad actually. Like, this hangs forever unless GHC detects it. And we get a fancy error we didn't expect. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, waiting for fork IO with MVARS. Okay, good. So what does this mean? You see stuff like this in production code, probably bad, right? If you see it in the implementation of async, that's fine. If you see it in your production code, that's bad. If you see some MVARs that are probably not necessary, you could replace with async, suggest that it be replaced with async. You see a fork IO anywhere, assume that the code is probably wrong because in most of the cases it is wrong. Some code may have been written before async was a thing, then you can update it. Some code was written after async was a thing. Maybe the author didn't know about async and um, you can improve this code and get much more stable stuff in production. So I, be on the lookout. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, async seems to help in this case where you want to run a computation asynchronously and uh, then return one final result. Yeah. If, however, you want a case where you have a continuously running background process which screams result, is there some uh, nice library you know of which would help there? I mean, yeah, uh, so could... yeah, I mean, the simplest way to do that in general is to do what I showed before, where we had this example where you use with, um, uh, with async to start a background thread, for example, something that pulls stuff from the database and so on, right? And then you can write uh, when you want communication to happen between like that and something else, you can use, let's say, MVARs, IORFs and whatnot, right? Or channels to communicate those things. And that is fine. Like if you like using MVARs inside code that uses async is still fine. There's no problem with that. You can then, because the key thing is that if something doesn't work, if something breaks, if an exception happens, then the thread will be killed and the related threads will be shut down with it, right? So it's not the data structure that hold the data that are the problem here, but the control flow like fork IO, uh, that is the problem. So that means if you have something that continuously does things and has, has to communicate them in the background thread, start the background thread with, with async or race, for example, um, or concurrently if the, both of these things eventually are supposed to shut down cleanly upon some su shutdown signal and let them communicate with chance, MVARs, IORFs, or STM. 
Thank you. Okay, um, that was that. Okay, now a little bit of practical stuff here, which is that currently we've done everything in I/O, right? Async runs with I/O. It has I/O in its signatures. It means you can use it where I/O is where I/O is used. But um, async also has in its uh, let's use concurrently. In concurrently, you can see that it uses I/O functions and it, things have I/O callbacks. So, for example, uh, let's do um, with async, right? Where's that gone? Right. They're like I/O callbacks that are being taken here. So this means that if you are in something that's not in I/O but more complicated than I/O, for example, in a monad transformer, let's say you are in reader t some value I/O, right? Async is not going to run there because it runs only in plain I/O. You can lift things using, let's say, lift or lift I/O that are I/O functions into reader t I/O, but that doesn't work with callbacks. You cannot easily lift callbacks, right? So for that case, whenever you need to lift something that has some callbacks inside, then you usually use unlift I/O, and um, that is being shown here. If you go to, I have it open already somewhere. Uh, let's just put this here. Okay, so if you go to the unlift I/O package, so here unlift I/O for example, it has this functionality of providing things that work in I/O callbacks for lots of base functionality and also for async in that case. So you go to unlift I/O async and you will find all the things that are, all the functions that are in async, but written in a way such that they do not only run in IO, but in any monad unlift IOM, which in a slightly simplified way as is all those monads and monad stacks in which you can run like IO based callbacks. So you can just remove your import of control concurrent async and instead put in unlift IO async after adding, for example, unlift IO here. I'm going to quit the GHCI because I have to restart it for this purpose. Uh, stack GHCI. Um, it's going to compile that stuff in its dependencies unless I have already done that. Now just a couple of dependencies here and you replace concur concurrent uh, this by uh, maybe like this and then um, yeah, stuff compiles as before, and now we can use it in reader TIO, for example. And I'm not going to make an example for that in this case, um, because I think the people who use that will already know how that works. And then those functions just uh, work in reader T, for example. Very convenient. Okay, now we come pretty much to the final point, which is like beyond Haskell. Um, there may be some resource considerations that one you want to do. For example, you download some stuff as in our example, make this thing a million long element list and things will start going wrong. Because if you start a million downloads at the same time, each of them will create a TCP connection, for example. You cannot, for various reasons, create a million TCP connections. For, simplest reason for that is they take RAM, right? If they take, I don't know, four kilobyte RAM, then you may already have like uh, four, uh, uh, gigabytes of RAM just creating the TCP connection and then you have not even accounted for the in, -bam, in RAM buffer of actually downloading the contents of that HTTP response, right? But if you use for concurrently on a million long element list, it will start a million green threads and these green threads will start downloading. So this means you will run out of memory guaranteed. Right? So in that case, this is no good code. And that is something that you should also always look for. When you see a for concurrently or anything that does parallel things over arbitrarily large inputs, you need to think, wait a moment, how large is this input? Can we actually run it in parallel? And uh, these things apply to everything like opening files, that kind of stuff, right? You want to be aware of this. What are approaches with which you can um, uh, restrict the amount of parallelism that is happening. Now, there are a couple. So for example, what you could do is that, I'm gonna comment this out again. Maybe I'll copy this entire stuff up here. 
So like this. Uh, one moment. Okay. Let's see if that, that compiles. Yes. So what you could do is that you could use, for example, a semaphore, right? A semaphore is something that is kind of a lock around a number. So you could implement a semaphore with an mvar, for example, that contains an integer. And every time that you kind of pull something from a semaphore, it decreases that number by one. So it could start with four, for example, for four threads. And then you can say, I make myself a semaphore um, that can uh, count up. Before. And every time you start the download, you increase the or decrease the semaphore. And every time a download finishes, you increase it again so that um, at the time where you got down to zero, that thread has to wait. And uh, yeah, then then uh, you have at max four things running. So for example, uh, uh, let's see if this was the name for the semaphore. Uh, yeah, I think that's here. Right. So for example, you can import control concurrent QSEM. Let's actually make this example on here. This is not an approach that I recommend, by the way, you will see in a moment why that is the case. I will also explain it. So let's make this here, let's make this uh, list comprehension instead that says URL one up to um, for I in one up to, I don't know, 20, like this, we do URL show I text pack of that thing. That's our URLs. Let's check that that files. Uh, yes, let's say this is an int. Yes, and um, we make ourselves a new QSEM with four slots. So that is, uh, semaphore, sem, with four in this case. And then I say, actually, I don't do that yet, I first run. Okay, so you see it starts them all in parallel, right? And then lots of stuff is happening. I make the new Q sem that gives me the sem, and then I can say, um, uh, I can say, um, with weight Q sem, I can, uh, draw one slot from the Q set from the semaphore and uh, with signal QSEM I can put one back. So I can wrap this up into a function uh, with QSEM. Let's do this here. Let with QSEM is a bracket in that case. Let's see if I have this a bracket underscore bracket underscore like this. And then this takes a function f, what I do with that thing. And then the type of that should probably be with QSEM. It takes a, uh, maybe we give it the SEM as well. It takes a QSEM and then we give it a function that is like an IO, I don't know, IOA for example, right? And then it should ideally return that IOA uh, as well. Let's see if that is correct, apparently not. Um, let's see, here's the SEM. Okay, of course we need to uh, give that the SEM actually. Um, I think the QSEM docs are another thing that we can improve. Okay, now we have uh, that thing here. And I also don't know why this function doesn't simply exist in this library, that would be very convenient. And now we can say with QSEM on that SEM, uh, perform this thing. And then you see we are running maximally uh, four things at the same time, right? So we're getting there, what we wanna do, limited parallelism, limited concurrency. Okay. And control seeing freeze exactly the ones that are currently running. That part is good, but it's still not good because what happens is that we still have, let's say a million for concurrently, a million threads being spawned. And then they all hang as the first thing you have a million threads of which like 999,996 are just blocking on that sem semaphore. So these threads take RAM, at least you don't take the RAM for the TCP connections and whatnot, but the threads themselves take some RAM. There may be some scheduling overhead as well. It has to check, okay, which ones should wake up now that we have that. And there's a bigger problem as well, which is that when one of these things dies, 
then async, for example, which implements for concurrently, will send a cancellation to all of these guys, right? But some cancellations may appear earlier than others. So for example, thread one may be canceled and before all the other threads have a chance to actually die, thread two, or let's say thread five, which was blocking before, um, will now say, ah, oh, now it got canceled. So now there is a QSAM slot available again. So I will start before its cancellation signal even arrives. So this means that after async has already canceled or after you have already pressed control C, this implementation will still start new threads which will of course shortly be canceled afterwards, right? Like, I don't know, a couple milliseconds later they will be killed again, but then new ones can start again until it has gone through the entire thing. And this is confusing behavior. Let's write this down here. Um, not great because, well, let's say safe, but not great because it will start more threads at cancellation. Um, because not all cancellation signals appear at the same time. So some uh, QSEM slots become free before their threads get canceled. Confusing behavior seen by the user. Right, so this means your, pro, your user presses control C and lots of things start, right? Usually you want to have the invariant that after you press control C, maybe the things that you were running so far were aborted, are aborted, but at least no new ones start anymore, right? But um, a semaphore-based implementation that starts all these things um, doesn't do that, so that's bad. Also bad because we start unlimited the many threads in for concurrently and then they all block. Okay. Memory usage and scheduling overhead. Okay, let's commit this. Let's commit this crime. Uh, QSAM example. Okay, that's that. So what should you use instead? Well, instead you should have something that starts, what do you really want underlying, right? Underlying you want that there will be only four threads running. Instead of saying, I wanna start a million things and then run only four of them, I can say, well, I just have the data in this queue, which is this URLs thing here, right? And I start only four like worker threads, for example, there exists actually only four threads instead of a million um, that block, four threads and they pull data out of this queue. And this is what is implemented, for example, in unlift.io at this thing here that we have inside the unlift.io docs, which I also had up, up somewhere there. If you go at the top right, um, put concurrency, uh, we implemented uh, these things, I think Alexi actually did it, right? Or was it CB? I'm not sure. Um, CB did, but uh, I reviewed uh, what a bit of it. That's but right. Your, yes. your was the original idea, as far as I remember. Yeah, I originally wrote this into some gist uh, on GitHub, and then it was like, oh. okay, I use this so often that it should really be part of some library and have like good documentation. So here we have now pooled map concurrently, and for example, which is just a drop in replacement for map concurrently, it has the same type signature, but it takes an integer that says how many threads to start. So for example, instead of saying pool or um, map concurrently, like your action and you map it over one to five, you just say, I want at maximum so and so many things to run in parallel. And then you can say, for example, if it's about downloading, you pick a reasonable number. Four in this case wouldn't be good because you can download more than four things at the same time because it's not CPU limited. For a CPU limited computation, Pick the number of course, that's good. For an IO limited computation that downloads stuff, 
pick like as much as you expect can fit on the computer. Maybe you want to compute this based on how much RAM that thing has available or what. Maybe you say, okay, downloading more than 100 times in par 100 things in parallel probably uh, is enough. You can compute it, for example, based on the speed of light. You'd say, what's the maximum latency if the server is on the other side of the world? Maybe 250 milliseconds. So maybe I should have so and so many downloads to saturate the average gigabit connection that you have at home, right? Um, that's that. If you have something CPU bound, then you can use this helper function, pull map concurrently without the N given. That will just use get num capabilities, so the number of course that you have for the first argument, this integer here, right? So let's say two on my machine, for example. Um, that's for CPU bound computations. Uh, okay, so very useful, also part of Unlift IO in that case. Right. But, but there is like a library that does this, that comes with async, it's called async pool, it's, and its interface is only marginally worse. So like, did, did you write this just because of that interface? Uh, no, I mean, the, pool? the a big reason why things are in Unlift IO in general is that it of course also supports the Monad Unlift IO, right? So this means you can All use right, it. But, but in call but I think things. your implementation does not use async pool internally, which is... Mm, I don't there. think so, no, think yeah. So I, for the, I would have to look at how it does that, but um, my original example, I think, that I wrote was probably this. Let's see if that is correct. So that's also- It's very close uh, to what you have for uh, in yeah. the current implementation. So, so this does this pooled map concurrently, right? That like um, gets these uh, pooled map concurrently and in this case that gets the num threads given. And if you're interested in how to implement something like that, so in this case it's implemented with like IO refs and MVARs and here you can really say, um, uh, we say we run num threads many jet which jointly consume jobs from that uh, 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 list of IO like list of inputs and IO refs where we store the outputs, and this thing is inside. Yeah, this is managed by this MVAR for as a lock, and then we consume them. These four threads, for example, consume them until this queue is empty, and then we just have like a simple loop that does that. If you're interested in how to implement something like this, then this might be a good starter, and then you can look at the full implementation in uh, Unlift DAO, for example, if you like. Okay, and this link is of course in the uh, repo description. Okay, that's that. And then we have one more thing that we may wanna do. In all the cases so far, we always had this pattern that um, uh, we always had this actually, before we do this, I will comment this stuff out because it's not great. Instead, we will put this, put good thing in here so that uh, didactically, if somebody clones the repo at this branch, there is like a safe solution at the very end. So did we already add unlift IO here? Yes. So let's go back here and put this in there. So unlift IO async, I think I put this already in. Yes, it's already in there. So I use uh, for concurrently, uh, let's say, uh, let concurrency uh, limit is four for concurrently, where's my pooled? I wanted to uh, give a quick comment while you uh, on yeah. the subject is uh, it doesn't, the pool mode concurrently doesn't use uh, async and because of that, it is uh, uh, much, much faster. Uh, even if you do uh, with the async pool, which uses async and then, just because it doesn't rely on STM and a lot of other things. Pool map concurrently is the, one of the, the fastest approach I've ever seen in Haskell doing this, uh, solving this task. Right, because I think async pool uses um, STM to, to shadow threads and it has like some sort of weird identities and dependency tracking in there. So yeah, it's probably slower. Okay, here we go. This is a better implementation of these uh, parallel downloading where we just say our concurrency limit is four and we just put it in there and then we're done with that. Okay, let's commit this. Okay, all right, good. So finally, all these things have had this pattern where we do some parallel stuff 
and then we get the results in a batch and then we do something with the results, right? In most cases, that is sufficient. There are some specific cases though, in which you don't want to wait with certain things while this stuff is happening. For example, let's say you're doing implementing a package manager. Most package managers first download everything and then they start installing stuff. But if you're really impatient, then you may want to start installing stuff already while things are being downloaded so that you don't first have something that like waits only on network and then have something that waits only on like CPU and disk and whatnot, right? Maybe you want to do both at the same time to be done faster. In that case, what you need is streaming processing. You want to have some functionality that produces results already when the first result is available and then hands it off to some other function that runs afterwards and then still keeps producing results meanwhile and the whole thing in parallel. Right. So if you're familiar with stream processing in general, you might know, for example, like the conduit or pipes libraries that does stuff like this, but they are themselves single threaded, like they stream stuff through, but they do not have um, parallelism in build necessarily. So uh, there are also some extra concerns of what you uh, uh, of, of, of what you may want to do with that. So for example, there's this concept, let's say I'm gonna draw this item down here actually. Let's say you're downloading things want or processing jobs and they have some numbers like this, right? And let's say you have um, some processing function like, uh, uh, let's say like uh, uh, run task or what, right? And then you wanna run run task two, one, uh, three and so on, right? So you may want to start with something that runs task one, two, three, four, and so on. But now often you want that the inputs, the input order is the output order. So you want to have, let's say something like that you get in the end a uh, result. So let's say, oh, sorry, let's say these are your inputs. And uh, let's say these are like, uh, I1 and so on, right? And then you have your outputs and you would like that these eventually are to be all of the outputs, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then often you may want to associate the inputs with the outputs, for example. And there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Either you can say, you make it such that, so if you have just something that just like does them in parallel and run task on input one takes like one second, and then this one takes 10 minutes, and this one takes one second again, then it might produce the outputs in some like random order, right? So you might end up with something like, I don't know, like uh, uh, one, let's say here, uh, three gets first and then two, right? And that's that may not be good because you may wanna then print stuff in the order requested. Let's say you in your package manager, there's some dependency order or what, and you wanna like, print them in the order as they were downloaded or whatever you may want to use, order may be important. One approach is to zip them up so that each of these things um, has next to it um, its input, right? Like this, and then you can like sort by the first element of the tuple to bring them in the correct order again. That would be like one approach, but um, you may also want that if you use the streaming processing that you cannot sort because for sorting, you need to first wait for all results to be ready, right? Otherwise you can't sort because who knows what element will come out later where you haven't really processed it yet. So it would be cool if the streaming function itself could guarantee that the output order is equal to the input order. Now, if you have that though, then you may have this problem that maybe um, O2 takes really long and this means that we can't really start like outputting the result, let's say oh, like the O3 oh, gets produced really quick, but we can't print it because O2 oh, is, is still running, right? So then everything afterwards has to wait to be output or like to be computed even um, because O2 oh, cannot be printed. So O2 oh, blocks the other ones. This is called head of line blocking, for example, in networking or TCP or what. And we have head of line blocking here as well. So this means that as long as this O2 is not done, its thread um, is is blocked essentially. It cannot do, or let's say the other threads, let's say, it's, I'm draw, gonna draw this thing here. This one is done, D for done, okay. This one is P for still processing. And then this one is done, this one is done, and this one is done, okay. Let's say we have four, uh, four slots, 
like worker slots in total, worker threads in total. And then the problem is that all of these things are done, but they cannot grab like the next output or next input to process because for that they would first have to, let's say, let go of like yield out or print or whatever their current thing. So this means that only when this one is done, can it be printed and that, that, and that, and then these threads that are currently holding on to those um, can start working on a new thing. So this means you may, in a simple implementation, then you may um, just like start, say you want four workers, but they're all blocked on one in the end. And you see only one uh, bar in your CPU uh, task tool. So that's not great. So what you really need for that case is you need to have some place where you can buffer outputs so that when this guy is done, that every thread processes not only one task in the sense as we wrote this here in this callback, right? But that they can say, okay, I will put this result somewhere where it's being remembered as being printed as soon as this guy is printed, right? But it can already process, like say like, let's say it puts this onto like some stash or what, right? And then it can start processing uh, this guy, right? And then these things can all be stashed. So this of course needs output storage somewhere to be put. And if these outputs are large, then they may have to be stored in RAM and you may are on auto RAM, right? So you may wanna control how many of those you will stash. And that is a consideration that you have to take when you do streaming processing. And for, for these concepts to solve this, uh, I've written a little library that does that essentially, which is called Conduit Concurrent Map. And it lives here. And it also has, it's also in Hackage. I'll make some comparisons to some other libraries down here. And we can look at its API, it has only one real function. And of course, again, a helper function that determines the number of CPUs automatically. But so it has this signature, um, which is, uh, one second. Here. I, and on the latest master version, I've also put the names of the arguments up top, actually, I think that's better. So concurrent map M in this case, is a conduit from the conduit library. We give it the number of threads and the output buffer size where each thread has a buffer of this many elements so that the outputs can be stashed in there. And um, when the results are done, then they are yielded from that thing. And this way you can say, for example, if each output is, let's say, I don't know, 100 megabytes of a big downloaded, uh, I don't know, tar image or whatever, then you can say, I know that maximally so and so many will fit in RAM. And so then you can see that, okay, I need to compute to set this such that the number of threads that I have times work output buffer size of the storage plus the currently running run, so plus one, so that that fits in memory, right? And then you can write stuff like conduit concurrent map M with these two values set. And then there are some extra considerations and it says what the beneficial properties are, for example, like bounded memory, the ordering is equal. It has full, C full utilization of your like CPU usage. It starts promptly, which is another uh, property I don't explain here now. And Async exception safety, just like async does it, uh, like async has it. And for that, um, I have here an example. So you use it like the following. Here's the test suite of uh, the concurrent map, where you can say, I make a conduit and I run this conduit and it has the following th three pipeline elements. The first thing just like creates inputs from a list with inputs one to six. And then the next pipeline element is this concurrent map M automatically detecting number of CPUs and saying each thing shall have four output slots. And then um, it says, okay, each of these things like uh, print something, does a thread delay, prints another thing, same thing like simulating a download or what, and then returns a value. And then um, consume turns the result into a list and that list is uh, returned in here. And then I just assert that sh this should be this and stack test shows that it is. So um, yeah. That's how this thing works. And this, this then allows you to make multiple pipeline elements. So you could call this, let's say like, uh, I don't know, parallel processing pipeline element, right? And then you could say, I don't know, like this thing is just that. And then you can make chains of multiple elements in here that all do like parallel processing inside if you want. And you will still get like, uh, 
the ordered output. And uh, as soon as the first element gets yielded from this, this one will start processing it. It will not wait for all of the things to finish. So if you need something like this, this is kind of like the, the, the yeah, a pretty like simple interface for doing this kind of stuff that like in like plain imperative approach may be very difficult to build. Okay, I think that's it. Then um, that was the resource consideration sections. Maybe Alexi would want to quickly explain again this thing with the implementation. Maybe not everybody got that. Then we'll do some more questions and then I have a thing for you to take away and we're done. Yeah, just a, a quick comment uh, on the async package. It's definitely a great tool. Um, this is the, like the go-to package to, to do with concurrency. Uh, although it is not a silver bullet. So there are places where it, uh, you, as Nicholas showed that uh, it, it doesn't work very well. Um, one note is uh, uh, whenever you do, let's say, map concurrently on a million element list, it's not gonna spin up a million threads. It's gonna spin up at least a million threads. For every call to concurrently, it uh, will create usually three threads, not two threads. So there is more overhead there. And uh, uh, it's usually not noticeable, but if uh, in some cases, uh, you can definitely speed it up. And uh, Michael Snowman had a, um, uh, an idea about that and he re, uh, did a little bit of re a little re-implementation. It's also part of the um, uh, Unlift IO package. Uh, say very similar interface to what Async has, but um, it will work in a lot of cases, it will work a little faster because it doesn't have that much overhead. Uh, there is a blog post about it. I will uh, link it in the, uh, in the Slack channel in a moment. Uh, one more comment I wanted to make is um, uh, GHC runtime system, uh, it, it has a preemptive scheduler, but sometimes if uh, there is no allocations, uh, memory allocation, it will not preempt. So there are cases where you have a, a race function. Uh, it can um, be the case that it's not gonna terminate if there is no allocation one thread happening. Um, I'm just uh, mentioning it just because I've uh, run into that problem on a couple of occasions and I thought there is a deadlock in actual in my code, but where in fact it is the uh, nature of GHC runtime system. And I'm going to also add a link in the Slack channel about that as well, just uh, so everybody's aware of it. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So I guess like the overall recommendation is, um, I mean, we recommend to use like Unlift IO, Unlift IO is async because it solves like many problems that uh, we already noticed. Um, the API is exactly the same as in async, but in general, when we talk about these concepts, we still call those things async essentially, even though the implementation is slightly different in uh, 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 Unlift IO. And that's, that's what I think we use in practice because of, also because it works like with the callbacks and so on, like we showed. Okay, let me check in Slack real quick if there are any further questions. Um, that was this. Uh, with regards to uh, the last section of this talk, I wanted to mention a library called, uh, what is it called? Uh, it's called Streamly, which is yet another streaming library, but unlike uh, all others, it can do parallel scheduling and like all kinds of it. A, a whole lot of combinators that allow you to combine um, combine streams in all kinds of sessions uh, and to configure the number of threads, the buffer size and everything, everything, everything is just crazy. Okay. One more point that I wanted to make based on things that are in the chat, which is like our like do async exception or like do, do, do runtime exceptions in general in Haskell make things worse. I am not sure that one could say that here because like the key considerations of like what shall happen when something fails is still something 
that you need to take care of, right? Even if these things had like fully either based APIs or whatnot that indicated failure based on return, you would still have to make this consideration. What do I want to happen when one of them fails, right? Do I want to be able to continue or do I want it to fail? And there would still have to be uh, the same type of logic that we have here, raise concurrently this like, um, uh, concurrently uh, applicative alternative and so on. All these things, they would still have to exist. I personally find it relatively convenient how this stuff works because with exceptions, you get something that's very clear of stuff that is probably right by default to shut down your thread. But of course in practice, or let's say in this way, I think I like the current setup also because it says, well, if you can't download stuff, an exception will be raised and then that will tear down your whole setup, right? Which means that things are usually like correct by default. And if you want something to continue in the face of error, then, then you can do that. And it's still kind of like the API is nice, right? I can write something as simple as pooled for concurrently with that limit and whatnot. And then I have two lines and the whole magic happens below that. So I'm not like unhappy with the current state of uh, how it works. Um, then there are the various links. I have one question. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, so you talked about uh, the, or I think Alex mentioned whenever you, when you do like say um, map concurrently, it'll spin up that number of green threads and yeah. then those map in some way to OS level threads. So like how, how is that kind of scheduling done between the green threads and the OS threads? Yeah, so I am not super familiar with the scheduler internals, but I think that it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a very simple uh, round robin scheduler that will just pick like the next thread and run it a bit. And there are certain points at which that scheduling can happen. Like usually the check for scheduling, I think is done whenever a uh, thread allocates Haskell memory, like bumps the heap pointer, for example, then uh, GHC keeps track whether it's now time for some other thread to run for some fairness. I don't think it's like super sophisticated or like has configurable scheduling um, logics like Linux has, for example. So I think that is relatively simple. And um, from observation though, it does work like pretty well in practice if you do like simple things like I haven't observed that like would be very unfortunate except from perhaps one one thing, which is that there are a couple of things that when you do them in async, they block, right? So for example, if you do things like um, foreign function interface, you call a C function, for example, there are multiple ways how you can do that. And I think that's probably worth a separate talk, how to do that kind of stuff correctly. But there's like, uh, safe FFI, unsafe FFI, and interruptible FFI. And when you start something in the safe FFI, it will start, the threaded runtime will start a separate thread for you. Um, but if you use the unsafe FFI, then it can bl block the entire um, P thread on which your green thread is running. So in that case, if you do that and uh, you accidentally call something that's unsafe, but still takes a long time, then um, out of your 100 threads, they will stop being scheduled and each of them is stuck in that uh, FFI uh, C function until that C function actually returns. So that is, for example, one consideration that you need to be careful with. But if the libraries that you're, write, uh, that you're using are written correctly and they do not use uh, unsafe FFI for long running functions, then that is not um, a problem. Yeah. Right. But, but like in general, you can kind of, uh, as a rule of thumb, kind of assume that every time you uh, start a new green thread, it's, it may result in a new OS thread being created. No, no. Uh, so the way that this works is that you do not, so if I do RTS minus N4, right, then for Haskell, for the normal Haskell purposes, there will be four capabilities, four green threads that, um, that will be running. And um, OS threads, you mean? Sorry, sorry, for OS threads that will be running for evaluating um, Haskell threads. And there's the, there can be other threads, though, like the things that I said before, which is um, when you start things that run safe FFI stuff. So, for example, let's say you implement downloading in curl, right? Um, then 
each of those things that run in C can start additional threads that get added on top of your limit of four that you give in RTS minus N. So even if I put like plus RTS minus N four and I run something that does lots of FFI stuff and I look in HTOP, I may actually see, let's say 50 OS threads, 50 P threads running in the background. Um, but from the Haskell perspective, this number is uh, what you will see spawned for that purpose. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one second. Um, um, what we have next is just a short summary, which is what would I like you to take away from this, right? The key things that you should remember. How does concurrency work in Haskell? We explained that with the n times m scheduling. What are the underlying primitives that is uh, Fork IO, right? That's the underlying primitive that starts a new thread. And then we can mess around with stateful variables to like communicate things or wait for those threads to finish. Fork IO is inherently like unit based. It cannot return values across thread boundaries. And there are various problems with it. What does async do? Async allows us to return values out of threads and allows us to create groups of threads that run together with certain semantics, such as all of n, one of n, and arbitrary nestings of those. That's what async does. It also provides these properties that we looked at before, which is that no thread is left unintended and exceptions are propagated up correctly. What functions should you use in practice? These are the functions from the, um, are the, functions from the high level API which are shown in the tutorial and high level utilities. Race, run concurrently, for concurrently, map concurrently, and uh, the concurrently um, U type with its applicative and alternative instances. What are common mistakes? Common mistakes are um, starting too many threads, not limiting in some form of pooling. Um, and of course, using this low level stuff that we showed down here, that's not working well. Okay, I think that's it. That's all that I wanted to show. I hope that after this, you feel like, okay, I now know how to use async, how to use like parallel and asynchronous programming in Haskell. If you really wanna go crazy on this topic, there's a, a book by Simon Marlow, oh. um, Concurrent Haskell. Let's bring this up real quick. Parallel and concurrent programming in Haskell and uh, async, for example, is one chapter in this book, but there are also other cool things explained in there. For example, how do you do uh, pure parallelism? If it's like computation, CPU bound parallelism, how do you do that? What kind of strategies can you use for that? How like does the RTS work in bigger detail? How can you use uh, software transactional memory, STM, to write like transactional stuff and so on? And um, it's a really good book and I recommend it. Okay, I think that's it and um, stopping the screen share and maybe we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, at that point, Jamal, uh, already a uh, huge thanks, Niklas, uh, for the great presentation and thanks everyone for uh, the great discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are uh, further out in time than we had scheduled, uh, but I mean, I'm gonna hang around, uh, Niklas, if, if uh, you have time. Um, and, and others, um, yeah, uh, I'll keep the meeting open and uh, we can have a discussion.